Hello, I'm Janan Fuchs, Professor of Biological Sciences here at the University of North Texas. Um, biology is a very broad field, as you can tell from our departmental website. I'm interested in neuroscience, which is the study of the nervous system. Neuroscientists uh, work on a variety of levels, um, from molecules through cells and up to behavior and cognition. I uh, actually got interested in neuroscience at a very early age uh, because I enjoyed watching animals, uh, especially insects and other invertebrates. Um, and I began collecting these things and keeping them in containers on our screen porch when I was about six years old. And I would watch spiders build webs and, and wonder, how do you even begin to figure out how to design a spider that knows how to build a web? Uh, and I would watch black swallowtail caterpillars eating parsley, and but they never ate tree leaves. And I wondered if they could be tricked into eating tree leaves. Um, my first real formal experiment in grade school was inspired by a Scientific American article about hormonal regulation of the transition from caterpillar to moth. And the article said, no one knows how a caterpillar knows that winter is coming, so it should stop eating and start making a cocoon. And I thought, wow, no one knows? I could be the first person to find out. I guess it would be day length, because that's the most consistent sign that winter is coming. So I collected uh, 150 tussock moth caterpillars and divided them into three groups with different photo periods. Um, uh, to this day, I find excitement in identifying something interesting that nobody knows, and you can be the first to find out. I, I've always enjoyed uh, inventing, creating, discovering, and I've always been inquisitive. Uh, I'm going to skip a few hundred stories and tell you about my lab's current lines of research. We study cilia in the nervous system. Um, we didn't sit down and decide, hey, let's study cilia in the nervous system. And in fact, I didn't know that neurons had cilia until I saw them by accident, um, or as we would say, serendipity. Uh, at the time, we were studying effects of experience on nervous system development. And we ordered an antibody to a G protein. It turned out that the antibody did not identify that, but it identified something in cilia. And so here is what we saw. We saw the red cells are neurons and the green are the, uh, the cilia. Uh, I was so amazed at this. I, I didn't even know neurons had cilia, but that's all they could be. So I ran down the hall and I typed into my computer neuronal cilia. Would we be the first to discover it? Well, uh, turns out we were 40 years late because people doing electron microscopy had already noticed them. They're very distinctive in cross-section. Um, but the electron microscopists thought that cilia were rare and were probably vestigial, useless. Um, I knew that they weren't rare, <clears throat> and I thought probably they weren't vestigial because there were other vertebrates besides just mammals that had them, so they must have been around for 400 million years, and that's long enough for evolution to figure out how to discard a useless organelle. So here you have something that is a, a common organelle. It probably has a function, and nobody knows what it does. And this is just the kind of fundamental mystery that I love to tackle. I did consult with my um, esteemed neuroscience colleagues, and they had not heard of uh, neuronal cilia, but they said, oh, don't, don't do that. You'll never get a grant. Uh, they probably don't do anything. Just forget about them. And I thought, hmm, nobody is interested in them. They're ours. <laughs> that didn't last very long, by the way. Um, now the field is huge, but, but at the time it was uh, very small and there was not much known. So uh, we did what we could by just looking. We noticed that some brain areas had neurons with very short cilia, and other brain areas had neurons with quite long cilia. And furthermore, the 
brain regions that had longer cilia tended to be very close to the fluid-filled cerebral ventricles. That was actually our first piece of evidence that cilia may detect hormones and other substances that diffuse from the ventricles out into the brain. We uh, just gave it some thought. What could the cilia do in response to a chemical signal? Well, one thing is that they are very close to the place in the neuron where action potentials are generated. And another is that they're free to sample. They're not like a synapse, that they're tied to only a certain type of input. And we thought that maybe they would be able to change membrane potential enough to influence the frequency of action potentials. And perhaps they were able to, they would be able to convert a bit of a, a hyperpolarization, which would protect neurons in case of too much excitation. And we also thought about the fact that cilia always stem from the centrioles, which are inside the centrosome. Um, cells have a centrosome, and before they divide, they, they duplicate it. And the cilium always has to be withdrawn in a cell like that before the cell can divide. And so this whole thing is very tied in with cell division. So we pictured a, a hypothesis as uh, being one that, that where the cilium picks up signals that tells the cell whether to divide or not to divide. And we actually had a chance to test that hypothesis when um, Brad Yoder's lab knocked out cilia in stem cells of neurons, selectively in those stem cells. And we found that indeed the cilia were gone from those cells and there were fewer of them. They apparently weren't getting their signals to proliferate. And sure enough, the mutant cerebellum remained very small in comparison to the wild type. So uh, we wanted to learn more about the relationship of cilia to cell cycle in neurogenesis. So we turned to a brain region, which is one of the very few to continue generating neurons throughout adulthood. You can see that these stem cells very commonly did have a cilium. We uh, found ways to identify each of the stages of neurogenesis, and we were especially interested in this uh, last stage here where your um, last progenitor cell is done dividing and commits to becoming a permanently post-mitotic neuron. When this happens, the cilium and centrosome change their characteristics quite markedly. So we uh, think that we can perhaps even tell when a cell can divide and then is ready to commit. I took all of our observations and made a model out of them. I like to make models because it makes a hypothesis more concrete. And it allows you to make predictions about what would happen if you were to change one of these steps. Um, um, so what about a neuron? It's, it is done dividing. Why does it have a cilium? We couldn't study a brain that was very abnormal. I wanted to look at a fairly normal brain, but one that had a subtle change in cilia. And that opportunity came along with the uh, the invention of a mutant mouse that can't make the somatostatin type 3 receptor. Um, about half of the brain region's neurons use this receptor on the cilium. It um, detects a hormone called somatostatin. Um, and these uh, two mice look quite normal. They look, their behavior is normal. The brain looks very, very normal. That is possibly because this receptor doesn't get put onto neuronal cilia until the neuron is fairly mature. So um, I thought, well, you know, if this cilium receptor is valuable to a neuron, then you ought to be able to stress a neuron and show that it's at a disadvantage not having this receptor. So how do you stress a neuron? Um, you can give the animal a convulsant, and that's what we did. And we found that the mutant was much more vulnerable, um, much more susceptible 
to uh, epilepsy. And uh, the levels of this receptor went up in epilepsy. Um, so we decided to look at a second receptor. So here we have somatostatin type 3, which we labeled in green, and uh, our second receptor. And we discovered this quite by accident. We discovered that in the wild type, if we look in the brain region that makes the first receptor, but not the second, and then we look at that same brain region in an animal that has the first receptor knocked out, lo and behold, the second one pops up in cilia. Why is that? We think what happens is that when the gene for the first receptor is knocked out, you also knock out the ability of that gene to suppress the alternative receptors. And we are um, investigating that hypothesis of receptor competition in cilia right now. Um, this was also very unexpected. Serendipity is wonderful. Um, in mice, most neurons survive epilepsy, epileptic seizures pretty well, but in rats they do not. Um, we wanted to see what happens as a, as a neuron dies. Does it lose its cilium first? And what we discovered was much more interesting than that. We discovered that uh, three days after seizure, these neurons highly upregulate their production of somatostatin-3. They don't have any cilia left, but they fill the cytoplasm with somatostatin-3. Uh, is this receptor connected with cell death? If so, does it have to be connected through the cilium? We do not know yet. We have uh, started looking at cilia in Alzheimer's disease because in Alzheimer's disease, neurons do actually try to go through the cell cycle and they die as a result. So um, perhaps the cilia there um, are not holding on adequately to the neuron and preventing it from dying. That's, we're testing it. And I wanted to just show you this briefly because this was the project of a TAM student. Um, we haven't published it yet, but we shall soon. So we have these um, three different cell types in culture, and we wanted to play with the differentiating media uh, differentiation media so that we could see what controls the birth of a cilium. Um, but we wanted a better way of measuring how, uh, whether the cell type fit into one of the, which of these three categories. And there were actually no morphological models of cells at the time. So Jonathan Dow took on this project and what he did is make a lot of measurements of the different cells and then put those measurements into a, a statistical model that showed that you could distinguish between these cell types very uh, easily just based on making a few morphological measurements. You didn't need the, the cell type markers, which tend to be kind of unreliable. Um, so that was really nice. Um, and the, the uh, current project involves cilia loss in the oligodendrocyte lineage. So the stem cells and progenitor cells that give rise to oligodendrocytes do have cilia, but then they're lost as this transition is made to mature oligodendrocyte that's done dividing. Uh, there are several cilia-associated pathways that also have profound effects on oligodendrocyte differentiation. So again, in a model, we propose that there are certain levels of activity in these cilia-associated pathways, and those levels are important for the cell to get to the stage where it's ready to transition. And then when the cilium is lost, you change the balance of those pathways in the direction that helps um, the maturation of the myelinating oligodendrocyte. And so far, uh, the data we've collected has supported this hypothesis very well. Um, so I've had a chance here to just tell you a little bit about some of these different routes that we've traveled, um, and we have a lot more to do. We're very excited to continue this research. There are two things you really need to get from uh, your college education. 
And one of these is learning how to get along with people. The other is learning how to learn. And research does a great job of helping on both fronts. Uh, in order to do research nowadays, you need to collaborate with people that have a variety of different uh, types of expertise. In your lab, it's something like an apartment where everybody has to do their share of upkeep and you have to learn to be considerate and thoughtful and respectful to your lab mates. You learn from them, you teach them, the lab becomes a home base and you fellow researchers can become lifelong friends that you will see at meetings every year for a long time. Research is all about teamwork, uh, networks of collaborating scientists, and uh, so, so it does give you a good training in getting along with other people. And what about learning how to learn? It's also very good for this. Uh, you may have had to read a textbook chapter that was not very interesting and you didn't get much out of it. Well, research is very different. There you don't start out with answers. Uh, you start with questions. And you have to reach out for the relevant information, um, bring it to bear on the question, organize it. And that active learning process is more meaningful and more successful than passive learning. And once you've um, got practice with that active type of learning, you'll find that it helps you in all of your classes. Um, a key advantage to being a researcher in any field, really, is that you become trained in evaluating evidence. Evaluating evidence is key to making good decisions uh, as a citizen, as a consumer, uh, as a voter. We urgently need good decision makers. Uh, you might not know that less than 7% of the world's population has a college degree. Um, hopefully you will get this degree and uh, with this rare gift comes your opportunity and um, perhaps your obligation to use your talents to make the world a better place, to make a difference, um, uh, to take on leadership roles. If I were starting today, I would definitely do research on issues of global climate change, and I would advocate for best policies. Because unless we do everything we can toward this goal, uh, research will be uh, perhaps even lost in the shuffle as people buy for places in a shrinkingly habitable earth. Um, this is a, a real threat. It's a really major threat. You can do certainly other research. We can't stop doing medical research. We can't stop learning about um, basic science that might help us in the future. Um, and we can make any piece of research into a window to the world, as we did with cilia. I mean, we use cilia to learn about cell division and cell differentiation and um, many different major uh, neurological diseases. We got. Um, quite far with, uh, with this by following our leads that we got. Um, but if you want to make a more uh, direct contribution toward global climate change, you, there are several areas you could consider, um, such as areas of environmental science, um, certainly engineering, um, political science, psychology, biology, sociology, administration, the, the, really the list goes on. I remember uh, the physicist Feynman saying that the way he decides what he should do is to multiply the magnitude of the problem by his ability to do something about it. And I think that the uh, magnitude of the coming climate changes are, is enormous. And I think you can do something about it. And in any case, I hope your undergraduate education will help you learn to think like a researcher and perhaps even be a researcher and go out there and make a difference and hopefully save the planet. Thank you.